I'm Sean O'Brien, President and CEO of NatureServe, and I want to welcome you to the 2021 Biodiversity Without Boundaries Conference. We're so glad that you're here. And of course, we realize you're not here here, but you're joining us for this incredibly important conference where we'll talk about the significance of biodiversity, bringing data to decisions, and the work that we all do together. I'm standing here in South Carolina right now in front of the uh, South Carolina state flower, yellow jasmine. And I've just spent the day with the South Carolina program, and I've just come also from North Carolina and Virginia programs where I did site visits as part of the Van Humboldt, I call it NatureServe Explorer Tour. I realize there's another NatureServe Explorer out there, um, where we're looking at on the ground work that the programs are doing to conserve biodiversity. Using the tools and the methodology that we all share, we're able to learn about species and habitats and how to protect them and it's just been such an amazing and powerful experience. And I'm really excited to continue to share that with you over the coming months. But I'm also really excited about the next four days of programming that we're gonna have here. We're gonna talk about technology and the advances in uh, NatureServe Explorer Pro. We're gonna talk about methodology, super exciting, I know, but actually some of the most important stuff we do is all of the shared methodology and techniques that we have. We're gonna talk about things that affect biodiversity like climate change. Um, you know, we're, uh, we're doing this virtually because nature has to adapt and we have to adapt and we're doing work that we hope um, as climate change affects nature, we will help nature adapt to that as well. And so over the next four days, we'll be joining you. Um, I'll be joining you remotely from uh, Florida and Alabama, which is gonna be really great. I'll be spending time with those programs during the conference. And I'm looking forward to you getting the chance to interact with all of us in this forum and in the future as we all are able to get back together again in person. Welcome to the first day of the 2021 Biodiversity Without Boundaries Conference. Uh, first, I wanna thank all of you for joining. This is such a great day. Um, it's unfortunate we can't all be together, but this is the way we are right now. And so we're gonna push through and have a great conference. I really want to thank our sponsors uh, who we couldn't do this without. It's so important to have their support in going forward uh, with Biodiversity Without Boundaries. And so please look at the website and check your emails to see who the sponsors were. And if you know them, uh, reach out and thank them. That would be really, really great. Um, as you know, I'm sitting in the Van Humboldt van. Um, this is the beginning of the uh, 2021 Nature Serve tour. Um, I'm wearing my Alexander Van Humboldt t-shirt. Uh, which I had made special for this uh, occasion. Um, and along with my specially made uh, t-shirt is my specially made magnet with the new logo that has the hexagon representing spatial data with a leaf and a salamander representing the species and ecosystems that we study in NatureServe and the NatureServe network. So we're uh, super excited to be here. I'm a little bit south of uh, Tallahassee in um, State Park, uh, I just forgot how to pronounce it, Frank. Help me here. Uh, it's Ocklockney River State Park. Ocklockney River State Park. And it is really, really beautiful. I'm so excited to be here. Um, and I'm so excited to have Frank Price with me, the Assistant Director and Data Manager for the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. Frank, welcome. Hi, Sean. Thanks for having me on today. It's a great day to have an excuse to get out of the office. Absolutely. That's that's what I'm here for is to help people get out of the office. Um, so, Frank, despite the pandemic and all of the challenges of the past year, you guys have had a great year down here in Florida. And I just wanted to have you tell us a little bit about some of the things that are happening in Florida and some of your successes. Sure, Sean, I'd be happy to. So it really has been an incredible year down here in Florida. We've been just insanely busy. We've actually had to bring on some new staff to handle all the work. Um, just to give you a little background on the, the situation we're in in Florida, um, we're lucky because our state actually has a, about 27% of our land area in conservation. So that's really awesome. But at the same time, we have a thousand new residents moving to the state every year. So that's net a thousand new residents uh, every day of the year. Um, so we're getting close to 400,000 new residents um, a year. If each one of those people wants to live on a quarter acre lot, we're looking at 100,000 acres of new residential development every year, plus all the associated commercial development, roads, everything else that goes along that. And on top of that, 
we're one of the states that's predicted to be the most heavily and immediately impacted by climate change. So we have some challenges. And as a result of that, I think that, you know, the, the need for heritage and heritage data has never been stronger, never been more urgent than it is right now. Um, so when we think of confronting these, these issues, um, heritage in Florida FNA is working in two main areas. First, we're doing our core heritage work of figuring out where the rarest species, rarest natural communities are, and assessing how their populations are doing. And then second, we're helping to guide land management efforts to make sure that lands that are in conservation are managed appropriately as possible. So I'm just gonna go through a couple examples of, of each of these types of work. So um, of course, with our core heritage work, that, that involves you know, mapping occurrences, EOs, of where the rarest species and, and natural communities are and those occurrences in the species. And one slight shift we've made in Florida over the past few years is to, to make sure that we're coordinating as closely as possible with the agencies involved in, in conservation decision-making. So these are the agencies like uh, the U.S. Forest Service, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, the State Fish and Wildlife Agency, all these groups that help to you know, actually make the decisions uh, that inform conservation. And so what we try to do is make sure that we understand their priorities and that our priorities for updating our core data are aligned with those as closely as possible so that when they need to make a decision, the data they need is ready right when they need it. And the, the, the second area we're working in is conservation land management information. And you can picture a situation like we're in, like I mentioned in the state where uh, more land is being developed every year. We're maybe going to lose some um, coastal habitat to, to uh, sea level rise. And so it gets more and more important to make sure that the areas that are conserved are managed appropriately. A couple examples of where we're working on that in Florida. Um, for the past 13 years, we've been doing uh, uh, the vegetation monitoring for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's objective-based vegetation monitoring program. And that's a program that assesses uh, vegetative structure to make sure that um, the, the management of those properties is progressing them toward a desired future condition. And uh, another, another example of our support of land management, of uh, inf providing information to guide land management, is in relation to Hurricane Michael. Uh, Hurricane Michael, if you don't remember, was a category five storm that impacted the Florida Panhandle in 2018. And it just changed a huge swath of the Panhandle, just thousands of acres of pine trees snapped off halfway up. Um, and there were seven state parks in the path of that storm. And a project we've been working on the past couple of years is to monitor the recovery of vegetation in those areas and to assess the impacts not only of the storm and how the vegetation is recovering, but also of the recovery efforts and how those impacted the storms and, and maybe how those could be uh, improved to look at what worked or what didn't work in the future. So I'm thinking about things like uh, the debris removal, salvage logging, that kind of stuff. It's important to make sure that that can be done in the most uh, sensitive ways possible to allow the parks to recover, to allow visitors to come back in safe, accessible ways, but also to make sure that um, the, the ecosystem is protected to the, the greatest extent possible. So um, this will be even more important if you consider that uh, hurricane activity is predicted to increase in the state. So it's a bit of a crunch time for conservation in Florida, but um, I'm glad Heritage is here to do our part. Absolutely. It's, um, it's really intimidating to think about 400,000 new people coming in with all of the other challenges uh, yeah. that you mentioned. And uh, it's really great that you guys are here and collecting this data and have been doing it and um, are really on top of all of this. Uh, and as part of that, we're actually going to go on a field visit tomorrow to a couple of sites. And I wanted you to preview for everyone where we're going to be going, because on Wednesday, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about what we saw out in the field here in Florida. OK, sure. Yeah. Um, so I understand the plan is for you guys to go to, um, to start off at. Bald Point State Park, which is a, an interesting piece of property from an FNA perspective because our data actually helps to inform 
the um, conservation land buying program, Florida Forever, um, which, which, which that program was purchased under. And it's, it's a neat piece of property. You'll see it's right at the mouth of the Ocalocne River. Um, there's a nice river mouth estuary there. It's actually one of the, um, the primary foraging grounds for the endangered temperate sea turtle. And after that, I think the plan is for you guys to move on to Wakulla Springs State Park, which is actually the largest freshwater spring in the world, the entire world. And that's just uh, about 20 minutes south of Tallahassee. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what adventures you guys have. Awesome, thank you. And I can't, I can't wait to see these, uh, these habitats and what we get to see out there as well. So uh, thanks Frank for joining us this, uh, this afternoon, I guess. And um, I wanted to just uh, let people know that what's gonna happen next is we're gonna show some highlights from across the network which we'll be continuing to show uh, throughout uh, BWB here over the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, and after the network highlights, we'll be joined by our keynote speaker, uh, science writer and science communications expert, Gabriel Popkin, who's a writer who's written for uh, the New York Times, Washington Post, Science uh, and Nature. And he's gonna talk to us about science communications and some of the work that he does. So uh, thank you again for joining us. And I wanna thank Frank and the rest of the Florida Natural Heritage Program for uh, helping us out with this awesome field trip. Thanks, Sean. All right, take care, see you all soon. Hello from Colorado. I'm David Anderson, director at the Colorado Natural Heritage Program here in front of a Colorado blue spruce, our state tree on a springy day um, here outside of our offices at, at Colorado Natural Heritage Program. And I'm so glad to join you at BWB this way this year and looking forward to doing that in person sometime before long. Um, wish I was with you all now doing that. Uh, things are going great here in Colorado at Colorado Natural Heritage Program. We're launching our ERT, which we're calling the Colorado Conservation Data Explorer, or CODEX, um, working with the wonderful folks at NatureServe on getting that launched, and that is going great. We're also surveying uh, Colorado's newest state park, which is our second largest state park called Fisher's Peak State Park, finding all kinds of cool animals and plants there. Come on out and volunteer with us and, and we'll take you on a grand adventure. Have a wonderful day. Good to see you. Bye. Hi everyone, this is Colin Chapman Lum with the Atlantic Canada Conservation Data Center. Uh, here to talk to you about uh, one of our 2020 highlights, Eastern Water Fan, a federally threatened species of aquatic cyanolichen. This is uh, endemic to Eastern North America and it ranges from North Georgia through the Appalachians into Quebec and Atlantic Canada. In 2019, we found a lot of it in Fundy National Park, roughly doubling the uh, known Canadian uh, population. Following this, we wanted to expand upon previous searches and find how much more there might be out there. So we had some incredible success with a few different projects in 2020, and we found it in 31 new streams. And this is amazing. Um, it shows that with dedicated surveys, we could uh, find new occurrences in Atlantic Canada. And this is particularly relevant to heritage programs in the Northeastern United States, where as far as I know, there have been no new occurrences found recently, and there have been documented extirpations uh, in certain streams. Greetings from the Idaho Natural Heritage Program. Did you know that roughly 70% of Idaho land is public, and almost 14% of that land is designated as wilderness. We welcome you to visit our open spaces where we work and play each and every day. The Idaho Natural Heritage Program is fully integrated within the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. Our team is a collective whole of species diversity and information system staff. Our mission is to preserve, protect, and perpetuate fish, wildlife, and plant resources we have a statutory responsibility for approximately 10,000 species. We collaborate alongside our agency peers and partners to collect, compile, and manage at-risk species information. This relationship allows us to directly inform our state wildlife action plan, ESA species status assessments, land use plans, modeling efforts, and more. 
Thank you. And have a great biodiversity without boundaries. I'm looking forward to seeing you all in person next year. The Illinois Monarch Project was formed to provide cohesion to individual conservation efforts, grouping them, packaging them in a way that makes the best use of our shared resources and energy. Illinois Monarch Action Plan includes five goals as a way to foster an army of conservation stewards and, of course, to benefit monarch butterflies. Our collective planning efforts culminated on a beautiful day in September when agency leaders from the Department of Natural Resources, Illinois Environmental Protection Agency, Department of Agriculture, and Department of Transportation gathered to sign the Illinois Monarch Action Plan into action. The event was live streamed and was followed by five virtual engagement events. We envision fully implementing Illinois' Monarch Plan as our next milestone rather than the finish line. Through helping monarchs, we help a variety of other pollinators and wildlife. Along with our partners in other states and at the national and international level, we are the super generation that will save the monarch butterfly. The Rhode Island Natural History Survey presents videos to showcase the animals, plants, geology, and natural systems that surround us. Rhode Island covers just 1,500 square miles, but it's home to over a million people. It's also home to tens of thousands of species of animals and plants, and people treasure the food, clean air and water, recreational opportunities, and quality of life they provide. But what do we really know about the life all around us? How do we name and count the species that are here? Are they doing okay? Will they continue to provide us with all the benefits we value? And are there useful lessons about the yep. world we can uh, learn good. from careful study of our own local environment? Luckily, our community is full of knowledgeable people, and creative researchers, and often the information we need is out there if we know who to talk to or we connect the right people together. That's what we're here to do. So join us as we delve into the plants, animals, people, and places that constitute Rhode Island's natural history. Hi, it's great to be here for Biodiversity Without Boundaries. Uh, my name is Gabriel Popkin. I'm an independent science and environmental journalist and writer. I live in Maryland, right outside Washington, DC. Um, and I write for a lot of different publications from the New York Times, Washington Post to Science, Nature, and many others. And uh, one theme in my writing, and I think the reason I've been invited to be here with you all today is that I do um, as, through my writing, try to help people um, kind of learn about biodiversity, try to get people to pay attention to biodiversity. And I thought I could share a few lessons from my work in this field that may be helpful to you all in thinking about how to sort of engage the public and connect with the public around the things that you're passionate about. Um, uh, real quickly, the background of my title slide here, it, I think is a great example of, of what I'm talking about. This is from Olympic National Park in Washington State. And clearly there's a lot of biodiversity going on there, but it's, it's not obvious to the average person kind of what to pay attention to, what's important, how it all fits together. And that's kind of where someone like me comes in, hopefully, to try to demystify that and sort of draw people's attention to things. Um, so this is kind of preaching to the choir, I think, for this audience, but it's helpful to think about where the public is coming to, to this um, topic from. Um, most people are not experts in plants or insects or any other taxa, but uh, most people can sort of take an interest in nature and sort of get this sense of awe from being in nature if, if they're helped to do this. So that's kind of my first point. Nature is just interesting and awesome all by itself. But also uh, nature helps us. I think we all know you know, many ways, just a few I can name quickly are, um, there's a lot of evidence and growing evidence that being in nature is good for physical health, it's good for mental health, that's extremely important all the time, but especially during a pandemic, obviously nature can help fight climate change, it can help 
uh, mitigate stormwater uh, storms for that matter. Um, so many things I could go on. Um, so that's kind of what's in it for us, but we're also in the midst of an extinction crisis and we're causing that crisis to a large extent. And I think most people, I'm sure most people listening to this talk, and I think most people in general would agree that we have a responsibility to do something, but in order to figure out what that something is, we need to know something about biodiversity. Um, and lastly, um, fascinating new science is coming out all the time about he how ecosystems work and species uh, function and interrelate. And that alone is a reason to care, just to kind of learn about fascinating science. Okay, so what's the problem? So many reasons to pay attention to biodiversity. Why, why do we even need help? Um, well, there's several things. One, nature is complex, like that photo I showed at the beginning. People like things to be simple. Um, biodiversity doesn't always work that way. And biodiversity science itself can be kind of wonky. Uh, we, one talks about alpha diversity, beta diversity. Um, th these terms, these concepts sometimes need to be demystified for the general public. Um, I hate to say this, but most of the public and most people like me and most of the editors I work with really don't know that much about nature or species and really need their hands held um, to kind of go on that journey of, of learning more about the natural world. And that's partly because Many of us are concentrated in cities. I think, I, I hope this isn't a statistic I'm mangling, but I think I've read that about 85% of people today in America live in cities and suburbs. So these are people who may go hiking on the weekend, may go to a national park once a year, but are not spending most of their time amid uh, plants and animals. And so they kind of really need help to um, kind of understand what, what's, what's out there and, and what it can do for them. Lots of other things competing for our attention. I don't think I need to go into detail there. Um, the bottom line is we all care about species. We care about ecosystems. Um, but to really kind of make a difference, it, it, it takes more than just people caring. We need, you know, there needs to be funding. There needs to be policy partnerships. The public needs to get engaged. And for all those things to happen, first, you need to get people to pay attention. And that's where someone like me can come in. You all are the experts. I'm certainly not an expert on biodiversity, but if I'm an expert on anything, as um, was said kindly during the introduction, is sort of how to bridge that gap to do that communication to the public. So the rest of my talk is just gonna be some examples of strategies that I've used and other writers like me have used to, uh, to get the public engaged. Um, and I'm gonna dive right in. Just, um, I, I will say that these uh, examples I, I use are heavily weighted to kind of my interests and maybe obsessions, which uh, tend to fall uh, heavily on trees, forests, and invasive species. But they can certainly be generalized to whatever ecosystems and species you're working on. Um, so this is a recent piece that I had in the New York Times. And unfortunately, disaster cells, I, there's a, I think everybody who reads the paper um, who reads the media knows that if, if, it, if it's like a catastrophe, like it's going to be right there on the front page, above the fold, um, on the home page nowadays. And so that, that's been um, one way that I've gotten attention, you know, for kind of my, my writing and, and for the science around invasive species is that just kind of really make it dramatic. Like here's the impacts that, that, that these species are having on our forests. Um, I didn't actually write this headline, but you know, I, can, I certainly can understand why the Times chose it. And the point I was making here is that there are a lot of parallels between the coronavirus, which kind of this disaster that everybody's paying a lot of attention to over the last year, and maybe the slower moving, um, um, you know, ongoing catastrophe around tree plagues like the hem hemlock woolly adelgid, emerald ash borer, and so on. But sort of by playing up that kind of crisis angle, I was able to get um, a piece in the New York Times op-ed section, which is one of the most highly visible places you can publish. Um, so I don't want to dwell too much on disaster, so I'll, I'll move on to the second strategy, which is hope. Um, people do tend to turn out, if, tune out, I'm sorry, if 
um, they're just being kind of hit over the head with one disaster after another. So I think many people are probably familiar with chestnut blight, wiped out the American chestnut more or less um, as a major tree about 100 years ago. But we're now at the point where there's a serious chance that the tree might be able to be brought back. And so I wrote a feature story for the New York Times Magazine about one of the strategies. Obviously, anything, whenever you talk about genetic engineering, there's a lot of emotions around this um, that probably helped convince the magazine to take this story. But, you know, I think one of the reasons the story was successful is that it wasn't just a disaster story. It was also a, a story of how we might recover and how science can help with that. Um, a second example um, from my work about a year ago, I wrote a story about how, I'm sorry, scientists are finding ways to bring back forests on mountaintop removal coal mines in Appalachia. I happen to be from Kentucky um, and, you know, have been really kind of, you know, concerned about the impacts of the coal mining industry on that state, on other states in Appalachia. But instead of um, writing a story about that, I chose to write about um, again, a, a story of recovery, of hope, and that was published in the Washington Post magazine. Um, but it's not all about disaster and, and hope. Um, there are other kind of angles, as we say, or windows into the, these topics. And one is to find a, a compelling character. Um, if you <laughs> could be yourself, could be somebody you work with. Uh, people, readers, the public, we love stories about people. Um, so I had been looking for a long time for a way to write a, what we call a feature story, sort of a longer story about the Emerald Ash Borer. And I didn't want it to just be, oh, here's another kind of disaster story about a tree. So, you know, in my reporting, I came across this scientist, uh, who works for the Forest Service, Jennifer Koch. Um, and she's actually kind of pushing a way to bring back the ash potentially using breeding, plant breeding. And that's kind of an old technique, but here it's being used for a new purpose. And I really uh, focused the story as much on Jennifer herself as on the ash tree, because, um, you know, it seemed like a, a, another way in a, so, sort of a character that readers could potentially connect with. I also like that this is a, a woman scientist in, in forestry, forestry is, as I'm sure everyone knows, a, traditionally a very male field. So um, it was great to be able to highlight um, a woman scientist even doing some important work here. And this was for Science Magazine. Um, characters don't have to be humans. Um, one of my earlier stories for science about the Eastern hemlock tree and the um, sort of fight to um, kind of rescue it from the hemlock woolly adelgid, which is an invasive insect that has devastated hemlocks. Um, this didn't really focus on one human character, but um, I think we more, it was more like we made the tree um, a character and uh, kind of I visited hemlocks in, in a number of different states in a number of different sort of ecosystems and settings and really tried to sort of paint a picture of this is sort of the, the full range of experiences that one can have with, with hemlock trees in the Eastern United States. Um, I just want to pause and say, if you are interested in reading any of these stories, they're all compiled on my website, which um, there will be a link at the end of this talk. So don't worry about trying to kind of read them or follow them now. Um, they'll, they'll all be available later. Um, surprises. So if, 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 you, if you read a lot of news, a lot of news stories, a lot of media, you kind of can tend to start thinking that you're seeing the same story over and over again. Um, and there is sort of this idea when I, when I pitch stories to editors, they always want a, something new, something different. And that can be a challenge because a lot of times something important has happened maybe in the field of conservation or, or ecology, but it's not necessarily like breaking news, but sometimes you do find something really new. And a few years ago, some scientists, they knew of my interest in hemlocks and they told me that they had found a new uh, species of hemlock. And that doesn't happen every day. A new species of temperate conifer. Um, the temperate world has been pretty, pretty well combed over. And, and yet there was this new species um, sort of hiding out on, on an island in Korea. 
Um, the scientists very kindly let me know when their paper finally came out, and I was able to write a story about it for National Geographic. And that, that sort of leads to a sub strategy for folks like you all. If you have some news, like don't just share it with your peers and colleagues. Um, find a journalist like myself or someone else who writes about the topic that you you work on. And you know, most of our email addresses are available online. Like, let us know what's happening. You might get a story like this out of it. Um, recently, just this actually just published a few days ago. Um, there was a new paper showing that these indigenous forest gardens in the Pacific Northwest had um, survived for more than 100 years without being managed. And more than that, they had higher functional biodiversity and, I'm sorry, functional diversity and um, biodiversity than the surrounding conifer forests. So this is a case where, you know, maybe from a native person's point of view, they might say, well, that's not surprising. We know we're good at managing these ecosystems. But sort of for the broader public, I think this is a surprising finding that we, we often think of human influences on nature as being negative. Here's an example, a very compelling one of a positive human influence on nature. So again, I wrote about that paper and, and a few others for National Geographic. Um, tell a personal story. If you have a good personal story about yourself, um, this can be a really kind of compelling way in to telling a story about what you care about, whether that be nature, biodiversity, a particular ecosystem you may work in. Um, so I had, you know, by the time this piece came out, I had written, you know, any number of stories about this scientist working in this ecosystem or this tree that's threatened by this insect. But here I actually wrote about myself and my own journey from really being completely ignorant about trees and forests to kind of waking up to kind of the diversity around me um, and also kind of starting the process of helping other people by leading tree walks. So I think that was kind of a different way into, into being able to write about these topics and open people's eyes to the diversity around them. Um, so th this, this may, be, may not work for everyone. Some people don't like uh, controversy. Uh, we journalists are sort of attracted to it like moths to a, a light outdoors. Um, but it, it is one way to kind of get attention is to um, you know, write about topics that are somewhat controversial. And I'm not saying like, I, I don't go into this saying everyone else is wrong and I'm right. That, that's not what I mean by controversy. I mean, just take something that people have emotions about. I'm sure many people who work on biodiversity, many of you all perhaps um, struggle with the Bradford pear. I know my mom in central Kentucky spends a lot of her time as a volunteer removing Bradford pears from natural areas. Um, but I thought I had a somewhat different way to look at it, which acknowledged a problem that this tree has caused and also tried to put it in a different context that hadn't been thought of. So I pitched this to the New York Times. They were interested. Um, didn't make everyone happy, but I think it, a lot, I did get a lot of feedback saying, oh, this is kind of a new and fresh way to look at the Bradford pear and the sort of challenges that it creates. Um, another species, iconic species for biodiversity, the monarch butterfly. Um, one of the few insects that most of the public, the American public at least, is, is familiar with. Um, again, I, I tried to write a piece that acknowledged what's so wonderful about the monarch while also making the point that maybe by focusing a little too heavily on the monarch, we may miss an opportunity to fully appreciate the biodiversity around us. Um, and this was published in the Atlantic a couple of years ago. And this is, this is an important one, I think, and one that um, maybe can get overlooked sometimes. Um, biodiversity, we tend to think of it as being sort of out there, out in the rural, rural areas, in parks and preserves. Um, again, as I said kind of earlier in this talk, something like 85% of people live in cities and suburbs. A lot of these people, like myself, you know, care deeply about nature and uh, ecosystems and species, 
but we often need a little bit of help because we're not living am among nature and ecosystems and cities. I'm sorry, not cities, nature's and eco nature and ecosystems um, intimately all the time. And one way to do this is to look at the nature and ecology that exists in cities, which can be surprisingly um, diverse and surprisingly rich. And this was actually my first piece ever for the New York Times. I uh, found a, a pretty large hemlock tree in my neighborhood here in suburban Maryland. And I thought about why is this tree doing so well when every time I go out into the woods, I see dead or dying hemlocks. And it occurred to me, it's probably because in this case, the city is actually providing somewhat of a haven. The tree is so isolated that it's hard for adelgids to find it. Whereas if it was out in, in the woods, it would probably be living among other hemlocks and you know, be much more of a target for adelgids. Thanks. So just the idea of nature in cities is a way to connect with people where they're at rather than asking them to come where, to where you're at all the time. Um, another recent story, um, this one really focused on an effort to make um, these forested parks in, in Southeast DC, which uh, is, is the poorest part of Washington DC, usable for residents. And it focused on this guy here, Nathan Harrington, who's taking it upon himself to clean them up and actually hiring locals to help him. So an, sort of a surprising place to look for biodiversity perhaps, but I, th I thought it made a nice story for the Washington Post. Um, lastly, a couple, a few strategies this, that where I'm highlighting other people's work, this was in nature and everyone knows the big story right now, uh, the big science story of the past year has been the pandemic. If you want people to pay attention, link it, whatever you're talking about to coronavirus. And that's what this article did. Um, clearly there's some kind of link between biodiversity and our own health and our societal health. And the more you can kind of make that case, I think the, the, the easier it will be to kind of get attention and, and funding right now. Uh, may, maybe not, you know, uh, if, if the pandemic kind of fades away, this, then this may be a little bit less relevant. Um, Climate change is a hot topic, especially with the new uh, presidential administration. It's kind of what everyone's talking about, at least in the environmental world. So again, making the argument, making the connections between conserving, I'm sorry, conserving biodiversity, conserving ecosystems, and what those ecosystems can do for us. I know we may all think they should be conserved just for their own sake. They don't need to be a means to an end, but um, if you're trying to reach sort of the broader public and the policy making world, uh, they really want to hear about what what nature can do for us. And this was actually, I think this story made it to the very top of the Washington Post website the other day. It's by Sarah Kaplan, who's a great science writer there. And lastly, um, people really want to do something. They don't just want to like read a story, um, but they want to know like, how can I get involved? And I think we see that with beekeeping. Everybody wants to save the bees. And the way people respond to that urge is often to keep a beehive. As people who know about biodiversity, we might say great impulse, but it's not the European honeybee that needs help. It's all the native bees. Um, so let's try to redirect that impulse maybe a little bit to um, our native insects. And I think Doug Tallamy is somebody who I find has just done a fantastic job of this. He as many of you probably know, he's an entomologist at University of Delaware, and he's really found a way to connect with the public by, I think, making biodiversity science simple, but not oversimplified. And um, his latest book is about why you should plant oaks. Now, we all know that every native tree out there has a role in the ecosystem, but if you want a message that you can kind of sum up in a headline, and get into the New York Times, um, maybe talk about one really important tree. And Talamy has done some research showing that, at least as far as caterpillars are concerned, it seems that oaks are the most important tree we can be planting here in the mid-Atlantic in the eastern United States. This actually, this article wasn't by Talamy, it's by someone else, but it, um, it mentions his work. So um, people love to help, people want to help. He, he's Talamy here is, is telling people how they can help.
so there's plenty of strategies and um, I'm, I'm, that's all I have. So I'm happy to take your questions now. Great, um, thank you, Gabriel. Um, we do have a few questions, um, so I'll just jump right into them. And a reminder to uh, those of you in the audience, you can upvote any of these questions that have already been asked or ask anyone. Um, so the first one, as an expert in science communications, how do you keep perspective on your audience's level of understanding compared to your level of knowledge? For a lot of us, it's easy to get lost in jargon without even realizing it. Well, that's a great question. So first of all, I, I, I know less jargon probably than most of you, so that may help. But um, also, I will also say my editors help a lot because even I can be prone to writing kind of in a jargony a wonky way if once I start to kind of learn a little bit about a topic um, if I've sort of been um, immersed in scientists speak through some interviews I've done or papers I've I've written my editors are to, to be honest even less expert usually than me in whatever I'm writing about and they can they can really help me understand like you can't you can't say this term because most people don't know what it means or you're using this term in a way that's unfamiliar to most people. And the other uh, suggestion I would give is think about how you would, um, let's say you went to a, a family gathering, like hopefully we'll start having family gatherings again soon. And you're talking to your cousins or whatever about the work you do. How would you explain it to them? Because assuming they don't work in ecology or, or conservation, because that's who you're, that's who the general public is. It's people who are interested, want to know something, but are coming to it with like really no, no background. So just think about the people in your life who are not your professional colleagues. Okay. Um, so the next question, uh, curious to hear your thoughts on the influence of social media on science and nature communication. Yeah, social media is definitely a big deal. I, I feel like I'm not that much of an expert in it. I, I think I, I actually tend to be a little old school and I get a lot of my information still from actually going to particular publications that I, I, I read a lot, New York Times, Post, Nature Science, et cetera, like going directly to their pages. But a lot of people, that, I mean, they, they do these surveys and a lot of people get most of their news from social media. So uh, certainly I would say it, in, in the science journalism world, Twitter is probably the most important platform. And what I appreciate about Twitter is that I can go in there and sort of lurk um, in a lot, you know, kind of in the background of a lot of different conversations going on among scientists, among my own colleagues in science journalism, and kind of keep tabs on what's going on. And if there's something like sort of happening, often Twitter is the first place that it will sort of become publicly visible even before somebody publishes something about it. As you know, it takes a long time for a peer review study to come out. So social media is definitely important as sort of a barometer of what's going on and um, a kind of a way to really keep, keep tabs, keep, keep a finger on the pulse um, of what's happening. I will say it, it can also be a real time waster and I'm sort of, not sure where I am on whether it's it, it's more beneficial or, or more distracting. I think it, it kind of goes back and forth sometimes. So if you don't feel like, if you're not like compelled to get on, if you're not on Twitter or something and you're, you don't really feel like you want to, like I don't, I don't tend to encourage people who aren't like naturally attracted to that kind of forum because it can really be overwhelming. Um, next question. Um, in a similar vein, how do you recommend balancing sharing information with the public about rare species or natural communities and keeping the public from them loving that rare species or natural community to death? That's a really important question. Actually, um, one, st one uh, story I wrote a few years ago, which was based on NatureServe data, um, found that at least if you, if you just go species count, like the number of I think it was plant species, rare plants that are um, being impacted negatively by people. The, the number one cause of those negative impacts was not climate change or um, biodiversity or habitat loss, all those things we think about. It was actually nature lovers. Um, 
whether that hikers, climbers, ATV drivers going out and as you say, like loving nature a bit too much. Um, certainly I would never divulge the location of a rare plant, um, like the exact location. And frankly, oftentimes those locations aren't even shared with me for that very reason or with other journalists, I assume. Um, and I, I do think about that. Like, I think that um, sometimes the, the sort of travel journalism really kind of encourages everyone to go check out something. And oftentimes these, these locations that people want to check out are, are quite small and can't really support a huge number of visitors. So I, I tend, I try not to write in ways that, that are going to necessarily make want, somebody want to, you know, book a plane ticket and, and go see, see a particular location themselves. I guess that maybe that's not something that I've directly had to deal with too much because I, the sorts of stories I write don't, don't tend to be like kind of those sorts of travel stories, but I do think it is something important to think about. We have time for one more question. Um, and uh, the next one is any tips on keeping the message intact when speaking to a journalist, such as how to prevent an interview from being misinterpreted, skewed or misquoted? Yeah, that's a, that's a great um, question. You know, I, I think that that's a concern that I hear a lot, um, you know, among scientists in general and, and certainly in the environmental and conservation world in particular. Um, I, I can say what I personally do as a journalist. First of all, I, I try to schedule like a, a good block of time, an hour for an interview. So I'm not just like asking three questions and then saying, okay, got to go by. Like I'm, I really, you know, have time to probe things that I don't understand, ask follow-up questions, like delve into some nuances. Um, I would also say that there are certain publications that I think are, are more dedicated to kind of ex exploring nuances, getting things right than others. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to name any bad examples, but I will say the New York Times, I recently had a story out about the wood pellet industry and sort of what its impact is on climate as well as on the forests of the southeastern US where this industry is really growing rapidly. And I think, you know, the, the Times devoted the resources, asked the editor to ask the right questions, and we ended up with a really well-balanced, nuanced story. Um, and so I would say, you know, pay attention, like what outlets out there, whether that be print outlets, online, radio, TV, et cetera, are doing the kind of stories that you want to see, like the right with, with the nuance that aren't oversimplifying and that, are, you know, are, are kind of getting it right, getting it accurate, and then reach out to those places or the, or to writers who write for those places and, you know, you have the right to, to decline an interview. If somebody, if you, if you think a writer or a publication is, you know, you've seen the past work and it, it doesn't look like kind of the kind of thing you want to be part of, you, you know, you, you do have the right to say no. But I, I would say the other suggestion I, I would make is um, prepare, like, you know, have, have your message, have your talking points ready. Um, the, the more you can kind of, You've, you've practiced delivering the information that you want in a format that's, you know, simple, but not oversimplified, as I said, and that um, is going to be digestible to whoever you're speaking to, that, that will really help. If you deliver sort of a paragraph long, jargon filled uh, answer to a question, then that's when the journalist who's probably on a tight deadline, not an expert in your field, is going to be like, trying to interpret what you said and filling in the gaps. And maybe that's where um, things don't always get communicated exactly right. Great. Uh, well, that is all the time we have. Thank you, Gabriel, for spending this time with us today. Um, really great way to kick off our conference.